Uh, so we're with Ray Price uh, this afternoon, President Nixon's uh, principal speechwriter in the White House and writer uh, before and after, uh, before he became president and after in San Clemente, and the author of really the, uh, I think, the seminal book about Nixon, uh, not only in terms of the biography, but in terms of the intellectual biography uh, with Nixon, uh, which really answers all the questions you have, but <laughs> at the risk of being super erogatory, I'll ask you, do you remember the first time uh, you, you met Nixon? Uh, the first I think I had met him to shake hands with one or two functions before, but uh, <clears throat> my, my connection with him began on Washington's birthday morning, 1967, back when Washington used to be born on February 22nd. And I woke up with one of the worst hangovers of my life, <laughs> which if you put together Yale, the Navy, and New York newspaper, he's saying quite a lot. And, my, and uh, uh, it was Richard Nixon calling. Uh, to see if I might be available, you want to talk and see if I might be available to help him with what might or might not become a campaign for 68. And uh, so uh, I <clears throat> gulped and uh, I ended up uh, saying sure. Uh, tried to, he asked me to come over and visit him at his home, uh, which was across Central Park from me in New York. And uh, I took, I rushed down to try to get some. Um, Hangover remedies in my place, in place, and did, and walked across the park and visited with him for three hours in his uh, in his apartment at Fifth Avenue and 62nd Street in New York. We talked for three hours about just about everything: politics, philosophy, the nation, the world, other candidates, other pot potential candidates, and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> at the end of it, he uh, said he wanted to settle this and asked me to give him an answer in a week. Uh, so I went home. I had a fairly extensive clipping file and library bearing on this, researched it intensively, and uh, by uh, the end of the week had this come somewhat to my surprise to the conclusion he was my candidate after all. The tougher thing is do you give up everything else and as a New York newspaperman face down all the all your friends who will think you're a traitor to truth and justice. Uh, I figured if he were, I should, so I called him back and said if he still wanted me to do it, I'd be glad to. He asked me to come on over, and we talked, and that started it. And he gave me an office down at his law firm, moved me into that, uh, where Rosemary Woods was in the outer office. Pat Buchanan had joined his staff a few months earlier, and uh, that began the, began the, the association. What was he like to work for as a uh, writer, there's a, in any uh, speech writing operation, there's a, co a collaborative element. Uh, what were his particular temperamental techniques? And uh... well, I, I wouldn't think of any temperamental techniques so much. But he was a he was a lawyer, and he was a, a he he knew how to write. He he was a good writer himself, um, and he knew how to think. And that to me, especially if you're in the public policy arena, the, the more important thing is the thinking. If you get the thinking straight, you're more likely to get the writing straight. And he was very good at that. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, when I when I started work, working with him, and it was at his law firm, as, as I said, and uh, but we were start, we were preparing for what might or might not become a campaign. He had not yet made a firm decision to run. He was preparing for a possible campaign. Uh, but we were kind of getting material together, and I was learning him and how he thought and so forth. Um, and then when we did start the campaign, which he launched in the, let's see, I forget now when, when it was he made his announcement. Um, I should have it in my mind. It's early January 68, maybe? I think, I yeah. think it was, yeah, yeah. I think it was. <coughs> and um, we put together a small staff, which began to grow. Uh, <coughs> then um, it was, I was working with him on, the, on, on issue analysis and so forth. It wasn't... Uh, Writing for him, of course, in the White House, though, was mostly not speech writing. It was um, because most of his speeches were not written. He was mo he was more comfortable without a text than with one. And my educated guess from the time that I ran the writing staff was that about one out of twenty speeches were written, and that was all. For the others, we would prepare what we called suggested remarks, uh, which would include material that he could weave into whatever he wanted to say, and then he would work it out. What work out himself what he wanted to say, and he would do it without notes. Uh, for a televised address uh, or a radio address, they would be written. Uh, and, um, 
but it was very much a back and forth process when uh, working on those, usually through eight or nine drafts. The State of the Union, I think, was always 14 drafts. I did those. And uh, until we had what he wanted to say it the way he wanted to say it. Do you have, uh, you were involved in so many speeches, for, uh, literally from the first inaugural yeah. to the yeah. to the resignation. Yeah. Uh, do you have one that stands out as a favorite of yours in terms either of its substance or its uh, language or its effect? No one really, I guess. The, um, uh, the, uh, the resignation, the announcement that he would resign, of course, is one that I would rather not have had to write, but if we're going to be done, I was glad to be the one doing it. And uh, it was a very tough time, a very emotional time, and I thought he handled it very well. Um, there's more satisfaction in doing inaugurals than there is in state resignations. And uh, the State of the Unions, of course, were massive chores because you try to lay out your lay out for Congress what it is you want Congress to do and to make the case for it. Uh, and you cover a lot of ground in those. Although we did, uh, we did, of course, inaugurate the, the program of having a written and a, and a, and a spoken. And so uh, these would be done quite differently. The, the written one would have a lot more detail and the spoken one would be more an oration. Is there a speech that you think is, has sort of been uh, as yet undiscovered in terms of its eloquence or its substance or its uh, impact? I've never tried to rate them really that way. Each, each one was different, each one was responded to a different set of circumstances and we tried to make it appropriate to those circumstances. I wouldn't really rate them one against another. We talked about the first time you uh, saw him. Do you remember the last time you saw him? Uh, the last time I saw him, um, I'm trying to remember, it may have been in his hospital when he was dying, I think. Um, I was out there a lot with him in San Clemente post-presidency, and I do remember visiting him in his hospital bed. Um, on the other hand, I remember having dinner with him after a hospitalization, too, when uh, one of those uh, sad things, uh, we gathered in his home out there, and uh, we were having drinks on tray tables and his leg bumped a table and a bottle of red wine went onto the floor and he got down with his bad one leg on one and tried to start mopping it up until his wife Pat came along and took it away from him and so forth. But um, uh, no, no, no one. And then do you have, uh, uh, I mean, you've talked some about your uh your memories of that resignation speech, no. but uh, can you give a foreshortened version of that? Uh, it, was, it was from a Tuesday to a Tuesday to, th to, to a Thursday yeah, uh, yeah. arc. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then he, he delivered the he delivered it. He, he's uh, Al Haig put me on put me on task on Tuesday, and he was delivering the the uh, the speech Thursday night, and so it was a very intense two days trying to. I forget now how many drafts we put it through. Probably usually it was usually about eight or nine though. On, on anything, except the State of the Union, which usually turned out 14. Um, At the Nixon Library, there are there's a slideshow, or there was a slideshow at any rate, of uh, photographs that were taken of the last day. Mm -hmm. And among my favorites, there's many of you at your desk in your office, and with, as everybody in those days, uh, pipe racks mm -hmm. and ashtrays, yeah, mm -hmm. and there's one actually where I think you have a cigarette and a pipe going <laughs> at the same time. I mean, it's sort of you could you could just title it "Pressure." <laughs> would, uh, did your staff know that? Uh, how many people on your staff knew that that's what you were preparing? Uh, my secretary did, Margaret Foote. She was used to keeping secrets, and um, I think she may have been the only one. I forget now whether anyone else was, but it was. Uh, I hid. If anyone was coming in, I would. I would make sure that my what I was working on was not visible. And was it hard to keep your emotions uh, hidden no, and what you were to? No, because I was not. A, I don't think I was approaching it emotionally. I was really just trying to make it prop, make it the appropriate way to end. Uh, I was sad that it had to. Sad to, had that it had to end this way. But if he was going to give a speech like this, I was glad to be the one doing it. 